want to say before we get started this morning, a huge thank you to Stephen, who looked after us with our teas and coffees. Thank you, Stephen. You were absolutely brilliant. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much. Thank you for all of your help. That was great. And if we've all got our cuppies, and funnily enough, after it been a beautiful morning, it's just starting to rain, so it's just as well that we're all inside. But we're going to come together and worship God. We're going to focus on God just now. And we're going to start by singing a beautiful little song, In My Life, Lord, Be Glorified. Now, same rules apply. If you want to stand and sing, you can, but if you're comfortable sitting, then by all means remain seated. It's entirely up to you. But we're going to sing this lovely little song together. In my life, Lord, be glorified. So let's talk to God. Let us pray. Loving Lord, as we come into your house this morning, we thank you for your unending love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, when our hearts turn hard and bitter. Help us, Lord, when we've our first words out of our mouths are to judge someone or to pull them down rather than to be encouraging and loving. Help us to show your compassion and your grace and your forgiveness in the way that you have poured out all of these things upon us. And help us too, Lord, to learn from you for you have given us so much direction and so much instruction that sometimes we become confused. So help us to focus on your son and the things that he taught us. As today we say the prayer that he taught us, as we say together, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have been following the, the early church, what happened when Jesus first went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came. And we've seen that 
it wasn't very easy for them. They got quite a lot of opposition. Opposition mainly from the Jewish church who weren't happy about this new teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. But it would be wrong to say that everybody was turning away. There were many Jewish people who were becoming what we would now call Christian. And there were also pagans who were becoming Christian. And maybe we should be a wee bit encouraged when we realize that they had a massive task to do, as we have, but they kept on going and they managed to make brilliant inroads. But there's something else as well that I want to show you today. Because it wasn't just the pressure from outside that they got, but they were having squabbles inside as well. Now, you'll notice I have, with the reason it's Acts 15, if you've got a Bible at home or if you've got a computer and you just put in Acts chapter 15, you can read the whole story, but just to save us some time, I have picked out little bits so that you can see what was happening and what the conclusion was. So this is Acts chapter 15. We believe that Acts was written by Luke, the same Luke that writes Luke Gospel. This is like volume two. And this is what he tells us. The meeting at Jerusalem. Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. And so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. They were sent on their way by, by the church. And as they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God. And this news brought great joy to all believers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, to whom they told all that God had done through them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this question. And after a long debate, Peter stood up and said, My friends, you know that a long time ago, God chose me from among you to preach the good news to the Gentiles so that they could hear and believe. And God, who knows the thoughts of everyone, showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he had to us. He made no difference between us and them. He forgave their sins because they believed. So then, why do you now want to put God to the test by laying a load on the backs of the believers which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry. No, we believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they are. Then the apostles and the elders, together with the whole church, decided to choose some men from the group and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose two men who were highly respected by the believers, Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, and they sent the following letter by them. We, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, send greetings to all our brothers of Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. 
We have heard that some who went from our group have troubled and upset you by what they said. They had not, however, received any instruction from us. And so we have met together and have all agreed to choose some messengers and send them to you. They will go with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. We send you then Judas and Silas, who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you beside these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols, eat no blood, eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things, with our best wishes. When the people read it, they were filled with joy by the message of encouragement. Amen. We're going to sing again another beautiful hymn, Great God, Your Love Has Called Us Here. Great God, your love has called us here as we by love for you.
know, I always find that in life, one of the things that I find the saddest is when you hear that saying, I will, that's how we've I done it. Because I always think, if that's how we've I done it, we've obviously not learned anything over the years. Because as time goes on, we find easier ways, we have different mechanisms, and we get better insight into something. And sometimes we only started to do it that way because we didn't have anything else that we could use or anything else that we could do. It's like when we got our first dishwasher and my husband said, I think I'll just keep on washing them in the sink. I go in your cell. It was less than 24 hours before he was telling me how brilliant this new dishwasher was. But if I was to say to you that this event that we're hearing about in the scriptures, and I need to say it doesn't just appear in Acts, what Luke has done, Luke has kind of written a wee account of it, but you get a bigger account as you read some of Paul's letters and you hear about it more and more often. If I was to say it's just a thing about um, people not liking something that was modern and something that was wanting something traditional, like, for example, some people prefer traditional worship. I get that all the time. And others say, no, I prefer non-traditional worship. Somebody once said to me, Oh, well, yes, we're fine with what, the way we do things because we don't like all that happy, clappy stuff. Yeah? Um, and, and, and I know fine that they were saying that because it was me that they were talking to. And I said, that, that's okay. That's a, but folks, this is deeper than that. And there's stuff that we need to learn about this as well because what tends to happen is if this kind of stuff starts to happen in God's family, in a church, people end up walking away. When you think about it, we're fractured already. We're Church of Scotland, but you've also got Methodist, and you've also got Baptist, and you've got Salvation Army, and that's just in Protestant, and I could go on, the list goes on and on and on, and then you turn to Catholicism, and there's differences there as well. All of us saying we're united in Christ, but you could, all these different divisions. And some of it comes down to interpretation of Scripture. And that, folks, is what this is all about. Remember, you've got Jewish people who have now become Christian. They have accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why he came. And they are following the teachings of Jesus, but only to a point. Because what they're saying is, but we've got all this stuff. We've been around forever. And this is how it was I done. And we've got all of these laws. And one of those laws, you know, we all, were, we all had to be circumcised. And you can't, you can't be accepted by God unless you've been circumcised. So they're kind of coming, bringing all of this tradition. This is how it's I been. And this is how we understand it to be. And then you've got people like Paul, who, remember, was a Jew, but he had this encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and he'd seen what God was doing with the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And Paul's saying, no, it's got nothing to do with that. The Holy Spirit himself has accepted these people just as we are. And Peter is saying exactly the same thing. Peter's the one that had this vision of all this unclean stuff coming down from heaven. And God's saying to him, don't you call unclean, what I have called clean. And do you know what I love about this? I love about the fact that they haven't got their heads around it all. That they're trying to understand themselves and they're trying to piece it together. 
And I, that makes me, that fills me with delight because nothing frightens me more than somebody who thinks they've got it all sorted, that they totally understand God, that they totally understand Scripture, and they totally understand this is the way it's got to be. That scares me a wee bit because it means that they've kind of learned something, but now they've kind of closed the door on the Holy Spirit teaching them anything else. Our lives are a lifelong journey with the Lord Jesus Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. And every year, I was going to say every day, but certainly every year, God teaches me something new. I particularly like the books that are written by Professor Tom Wright. He wrote a whole series of books called For Everyone. And it's the New Testament. And it'll start off with Matthew, For Everyone. And it has a little bit of Matthew, and then it explains what that's about. And then another little bit, and explains what it's about. And he puts it in simplistic terms for everyone to understand. And one of the things I particularly loved was I was reading one of his newer books, and he said in it, you're going to find in here I'm possibly going to contradict some stuff that I wrote years ago. And that's because I have a different understanding now. And I thought, hallelujah, somebody that's listening to God and allowing God to lead him. And I always think, if you're in doubt, look back to see what Jesus said. Now, what the Apostle Paul and what Peter and what Silas and Barnabas and the others were saying was that God himself chose the Gentiles by baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. And what he didn't do was give them the burden of all these laws from Moses' time. And an interesting little thing that Peter said, that neither us nor our ancestors could live by them all. Now that's interesting. Because God does not set us up to fail. God wants to strengthen and encourage us. He doesn't want our lives to be a drudge and a burden because the scripture says that he delights in us and he wants us to delight in our life and in him. And it's this business of like, well, what do we do then? How, how do we balance it all out? And what they do is they have a big debate. It would have been lovely to have been a fly on the wall to hear that debate going on. I wonder how long it lasted. Because I sometimes moan when I'm at the General Assembly and it goes on a bit long, but I wonder how this debate lasted. And what they were trying to put in the balance there is that the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did through love of us. Nothing that we did to earn it Nothing that we could say to earn it. It was just through his love and grace. And so they realized that if God isn't putting that burden on them, why should we? Now there's a message for the whole church here with this. Because sometimes what we do is we look at the scripture and we listen to what Jesus says and then we go charging back into the Old Testament and embed ourselves there. And instead of doing what Jesus has said, we start to put all of these laws back on and then try to judge others because they haven't. Oh, well, that's not right. They shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. When Jesus himself says there's two great commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your body, with all your strength. And if you take time out with him every day, that grows and it grows and it grows. And then love one another as you love yourself. 
Jesus points us in the direction of the love of God. It's the one wee bitty I would have added as a PS to that letter. The letter was a lot longer, by the way, than what I read to you. If you look at Acts chapter 15, you'll see it's quite a long letter. But it was interesting to see that what they're asking them to do is to just keep one or two laws that will keep them safe, that will keep them safe bodily, that will keep them safe emotionally, that will try to stop them from having broken relationships, and that passes on and on and on. But I suspect, you know what, if they just put those, those two little biddies that the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, that might have just done the trick. Because if that's what we work at, then we become the encouragers. If that's what we work at, then we become those who forgive. If that's what we work as, then we draw close to God and we manage our relationships with other people. A lot for us to learn from as we move forward as a church because what we have to do more than anything is protect our relationships and protect our integrity before God because he wants us to be able to live with clean hands and clean hearts not full of bitterness, not full of argument, and not full of division. Interestingly, one of the passages that I read on Sunday said a little bit like about don't get into squabbles about laws. Isn't that interesting? They say, don't even bother focusing on that. Focus on loving one another as you love yourself and loving God. Focus that way, and that keeps your relationships right. And sometimes we find ourselves going off down the wrong path. And that's when we have to remember these little letters. Remember the little bit at the end? I put it in there deliberately. Because when these people received this word from the other disciples, especially with it saying, the Holy Spirit and we have decided that, it said they were so encouraged. Our church family should be a place where we come for encouragement. Not to be torn down, not to be worn down, but that we encourage one another and draw close to God together. So let's talk to God right now. Let us pray. Loving Lord, this morning, I in particular thank you for our church family. Thank you that we're all different. Thank you that we have different backgrounds and different skills and different qualities. And Lord, we pray this morning that our love of you would grow and it would grow so much. It would fill us so much that there would be no room for criticism, no room for anger, no room for frustration but that we would be so full of your love that we would reach out to one another in compassion and joy. Help us to be the encouragers. Lord, this morning we read of Barnabas, who was called the encourager. May we have hearts like Barnabas, that we would follow you and encourage others. Lord, we pray for your church locally and for your church worldwide. We pray that over this summertime, locally, we get the chance to reach out. And we pray for every single family who has been here this week and will continue to come through this summer. Lord, be with them, protect them, and bless them, and draw them close to you. We pray for the wider church. May we not get bogged down in disagreement, but may we focus on you and your love. We pray, Lord, for the problems of our world. And we think especially of Ukraine and for Russia. And Lord, each and every one of us understands that there's no quick fix Because if peace were to be called today, 
one side or the other would want to be able to save face. And so we pray that you would give us a way, give us a mechanism that peace could be restored, that lives could be rebuilt. Loving God, we know that there is not just one war in our world, but there are uprisings, there is rebellion, there is poverty and injustice. And sometimes we feel completely inadequate. One small voice among many. But you are a great and mighty God. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to do great things. And so we ask that we would never be shy to speak up, that we would never be afraid that we would always point to, to do what is right before you, that we would see your love and your justice in our world. Loving God, we pray for one another. We pray for all of those who are watching at home, each and every one. We pray for our neighbours, our families, our friends. And we ask that you would touch them and draw them close to you. For their needs are many, as are ours. And today we pray for those who are here, those in front and behind, that you would draw close to each and every one. We ask that you would keep your, your hand upon those who have gone on holiday. Keep them safe, Lord. May they not have a holiday from you, but be more aware of your presence wherever they are. Let me ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to close by singing a brilliant hymn, To God Be the Glory.
So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you evermore. Amen.